My sin is ever before me, Lord. I bow my heart in shame. Condemned and guilty, I come to you and call upon your Forgive me, Lord, forgive me, Lord, and wash me white as snow. My sin is ever before me, Lord, have mercy on my soul. My sin is ever before me, Lord. Oh, claim me as your own. Break down each idol, cast out each foe, and make my heart your throne. Forgive. My sin is ever before me, Lord, have mercy on my soul, have mercy on my soul, and wash me white as snow. be a good prayer to pray, wouldn't it? That'd be a good thing to pray. Take your Bibles over to 1 Thessalonians again. I've been stuck in 1 Thessalonians for a while, back and forth. I'm learning some things that uh, I believe the Lord can use to encourage and help us. <clears throat> and... Uh, us that he will do so again this morning. First Thessalonians chapter number one, and we'll start reading in verse number one. <clears throat> Been back and forth in Thessalonians for the last few weeks. Thank you very much. If you found your spot, you can stand. If you have the ability to do that, that'd be awesome. That's a Have you ever been to a, 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 a religious service ceremony where they did things and you wondered, why did they do that? I grew up in one of those. You was always asking, why do we do that? What, what's that? Well, the reason we stand is because in the Old Testament, they stood for the reading of the Word of God. And they stood, by the way, just about all day. And the preachers were up on a pulpit of wood and, and expounded the Word of God and met, gave them the sense and, and the explanation and the, the meanings of the words and all of that. We, th this is just what we see there, and it's a way to respect the Word of God. And uh, you won't have to stand the whole service. You're welcome. But if we could just stand for a moment till we get the Word of God read, we pray and ask God to help us with the understanding and the explanation of it, and then we can sit. It's, it's much better taking notes when you're seated, by the way. It'd be hard to take notes standing up. And I strongly encourage you to take notes. It will help you to learn if you do. We're going to read these first ten verses in this passage. It says, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalon uh, Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you, uh, for you all rather, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Verse 6 says, And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you, for from you, for from you, sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak any thing. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for your love and mercy, for your grace and kindness. And I pray that you'd help. Uh, Father, as I've told you many times uh, this weekend and certainly this morning, I can't do this without you. I have no power. I have no strength. I have no authority. Uh, Father, I pray that you'd help me now to communicate your word effectively and the message that you've laid on my heart. And that, Father, you would take that word and apply it to each and every life, those that are listening in on YouTube, those that are here presently, those that might listen later, I pray that you accomplish your will in our lives through the message uh, taught and explained in the word uh, read this morning that uh, you do what you can do and what you need to do in our lives. And we'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Have a seat. You know, we've been learning from First Thessalonians for a few weeks now um, <clears throat> about the plan of God for our lives. What does God want to do? What's God's plan for your life, for my life? What's he want to do? And so uh, we're going to talk about that again this morning. Uh, what is it that God praised the church of the Thessalonians for that we can and should emulate in our lives today? I mean, when you look in the Word of God, no matter which chapter or which verse, what book, what, what place, Old Testament, New Testament, you should always approach it with, okay, God, what did you do there that you want to do in my life? How does this apply to me today? What does this mean to me today or for me today? How should I conduct business in my life uh, according to what you've said and revealed in this, in this verse? I mean, God doesn't, he didn't write anything down that wasn't important, you realize. And he, if he wrote everything down, we, we don't have enough paper on planet earth then or now or in the combination thereof to record everything that God's done for us. Even what Jesus did while he was ministering on the earth, we don't have enough paper to write it down. So when we come to something that get, God did take the time and the paper to write down, we ought to pay attention to it. We ought to take heed to it. We ought to really ask the question, what's this here for? And what does it mean to me? And, and why is it so important that God had this wrote down for us to be able to read and study and think about? All right. Last week, when we looked at Second uh, Thessalonians chapter one, uh, we saw that God praised them for their growing faith and their abounding love, and we talked about how we need to emulate that. We need to have that in our life. We need to grow our faith in Him, and then while we're doing that, we need to abound in love toward the brethren. That's how we demonstrate our faith in God by loving the brethren. You know, they're they're going to know us by our love one for another. Okay. The week before that, we saw how God's desire uh, was to sanctify and then to preserve them blameless under the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I noticed that in our text this morning, verse 10, 
and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus. He's talking about his next coming, right? Not the last one, which delivered us from the wrath to come, right? So as, as the Bible is written, that's the next thing we're looking for. Jesus did rise from the dead. He, he came the first time. He lived. He was crucified. He died. He was buried. He rose again, ascended back up. And now we're looking for his second coming, his second appearing, all right? And while we're doing that, we're preparing for that to be preserved and ready for that. And we're supposed to be reaching others with the gospel message that Jesus came, he lived, he died, he rose again to pay for their sins as well as ours. This week, we're going to look at this section here and see how God used them, and I mean the Thessalonians, and I mean Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, as examples so that those around them could see their growing faith, could see what God had done in their life, and then draw those people, the observers, to himself. And how we need to emulate that as well in our lives. So we notice in our text that this is written from the, from the perspective of praise. In other words, it, this isn't corrective in nature. This is instructive for sure. But primarily, it's written as a praise for the Thessalonians. You're doing good. You did well. You, th this is exactly what you were supposed to do. Do you see how that's written? Understand something. When God causes someone to be praised, it ought to perk our ears up because I want to. I want to be praised. I want to. I want get, God. When you look at me, I want you to think about me like you thought of the Thessalonians there, right? Uh, and uh, he doesn't have to write anything about it as long as when I get there, he says, "Good job," right? I want. I want to uh, know that I served him well when I stand before him. So the Thessalonians were praised for their response to the gospel and then their influence on others with the gospel and because of the gospel. I hope you can see that. We're going to look at that. That's really the thought for us today, and that's what I believe God wants us to do, and his purpose and plan for us is to respond to the gospel, and then that response should help us to be uh, an example to others because of the gospel. Notice in verse number 9, we're going to look at verse 9 first. He says, for they themselves. Now, he's speaking of a third party, right? The, this letter is written to the Thessalonians, but understand that verse 9 is written about someone else. For they themselves show us what manner of entering in we had unto you. So there's three parties. There's Paul, Savinius, and Timotheus. And then they're writing to the Thessalonian church about these other people that, that they themselves show us what manner of entering in we had with you and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Understand the context. It would be like me talking to Braden about something he did really well, and I know you did it really well because you taught him, and he showed me what you taught him, and man, you did a good job teaching him. That's what this is saying. Paul's like, Paul is writing to the Thessalonians saying, man, when we came and we started the church at Thessalonica, and we were teaching you and preaching to you and sharing with you, and you learned it, and you learned it well because now I've come in contact with this other group over here, and you taught them. And guess what? Everything that we see in their life is what we taught you. And that is evidence that you learned it and learned it well. Now, why is that important? Because that's what we're supposed to be doing, right? Right? But notice what he says here going on here, and we're going to come back and we're going to spend a lot more time at that in a moment. But he said, what manner of entering in we had unto you, and it goes on, and how ye turned from God, uh, from, uh, to God rather, thank you, that you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. He said, you 
your life demonstrated and, and your turning to God from idols is, can be seen in, and the effect of that can be seen in these other people that you have since been an example to, and we see it in their lives. But you turn to God from idols, right? They had turned from probably actual idols, carved stones and carved wood and molten images and, and things that they made to represent God. They had falsely believed and worshipped inanimate man-made figurines, and that was their sin. That was what the Thessalonians had issue with, and when Paul went and preached to them, that was the thing that, that they struggled with, was worshipping uh, man-made images instead of the holy God of heaven. Now, listen, there are people that worship a lot of different things today. There are people that worship the sun, the moon, the stars. There are people that worship their car and their house and their grass. There are people that worship their money and people that worship themselves. There are people that still worship idols, and they bow down and pray to them. But that may not be your problem today. That may not be where you came from. Your uh, prevailing sin, your, your sin that, that so easily doth beset you may not be idols. And I want you to understand something. It doesn't matter what you turned to God from, but it's praiseworthy that you turned to God from anything, because anything but God should not be worshipped. He is the only true God. He is the only righteous God. He is the only creator God. And so just understand that while the Thessalonians turned from idols, many of us turned from other things. And what is praiseworthy is that we turn to God and only turn to God. And I wonder this morning, have you turned to God? Have you truly turned to God? If so, just remind yourself for a moment and consider for what have you turned to God from? Have you indeed laid down your idols or whatever else it was to turn to God and abandon those other things? Because those things were the sinful things. Those things were the things that were coming in between you and your God and separating between you and your God, whatever that sin was. I want you to consider something. The, the writer of the book of Thessalonians is Paul, as it says in verse 1. He's writing on behalf of or with Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church at Thessalonia. But I want you to go back for a moment to Paul's conversion. That's in Acts chapter 26. We learn about Paul getting saved. Just back to the left through the book of Romans. Acts chapter 26, he's here, Paul is here telling the king about his conversion testimony, all right? And how Paul himself turned from religion to serve the one and true and only living God. Now understand that this could be you or I, this could be anybody. This, this is Paul's testimony of when he turned from worshiping incorrectly to worshiping the one true God. And in Acts chapter 26, verses 15 through 18, it's the only part that I'm going to read with you. And, he, and I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. All right, now I've been... We, what, We've been preaching about this. What is God's purpose? When he saves someone, when someone turns to him from something else, I've, t I've been telling you he has a purpose. He has a plan. He has an objective. There is something he has for you to do. And I want you to see that. It's spelled out well when Paul accepts Christ as his Savior uh, and, and, and he becomes an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ unto us Gentiles. God says, listen, I have a, a purpose, right? Um, 
I am Jesus whom thou persecutest, but rise and stand upon thy feet, uh, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things which, uh, in the which I will appear unto thee. Verse 17, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. You all remember what it says in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, as well as Acts 1, 8, and Mark 16, and, and, and John 15, and all those other places, right? Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel unto every creature. He had the same purpose for Paul that he has for us. He has the same purpose for everyone that accepts Christ. When we accept Christ, when we turn from our idols or our religions or whatever else it is, and we turn to Christ, he has a purpose for us. And he spells it out here uh, to Paul. Verse 17, delivering thee from the, Gent uh, from the people and from the Gentiles, whom now I send thee. Verse 18, notice he says, to open their eyes. And to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. Remember a few weeks ago I preached about uh, we're, we're taken captive by him, by Satan at his will, right? And from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive what? Forgiveness of sins. God wants to pe have people receive the forgiveness of sins. And he says, inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. By the way, that's exactly what God ta told Paul to do in those days, and that's exactly what he was doing in Thessalonia, is he was saying, you know what? I came and I preached the gospel and I explained things and expounded things and exemplified things, and you listened, and then you listened so well, you went and you did it to these, and when I go visit them, they are telling me, they are showing me by their life that you learned well. They are showing me by how they got saved and how they turned to God from their, uh, whatever their besetting sin was. He said, what you did for them is exactly what I did for you, and it's exactly what God told me to do for you so that you could then go do it for them, right? So, uh, and it's exactly what he tells us to do, Right? In Acts 1 8, I'll remind you, it says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. God's purpose and God's plan for our life is not retirement. Not here, anyway. God's purpose and plan for our life doesn't involve. Big bank accounts on this side. He, he plans for us to invest in our accounts in heaven. He plans for us to, to store up our wealth in heaven. He plans for us to help people with the gospel message like Paul did the Thessalonians, and then the Thessalonians did unto these, whoever they were. And by the way, if you read this text and understand it, he says, wherever I go, right? Right? Uh, in, uh, uh, verse, uh, in verse 7 and 8, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and in Achaia, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith to God word is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. He goes, everywhere I go, I'm hearing about you. I'm hearing about your faith. I'm hearing about your turning to God from these idols. I'm, you're, you've been a great testimony to all the people. Heartland Baptist Church, I wonder, wouldn't it be an incredible thing if we got to heaven and our testimony in heaven was they affected people all Everywhere anyone went, they heard about Heartland Baptist Church and how they loved getting the gospel to people and how they loved reaching people with the gospel. Wouldn't that be an incredible thing? I want it. 
I, I want that testimony. I want what Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. I want people to say of us, man, they did good. And of course, it's all because of Jesus Christ. But again, I wonder, have we turned to God yet? If not, today would be a great day to turn to God from whatever else we, we might turn from whether it's idols or religion like it was with Paul or some other thing, we need to turn to God. And if we haven't, we should. Now back in our text. I want to pick up verse 6 and look at a second thought here that I see. Verse 6 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. He says, And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Right? They became followers of us, he said, and of the Lord. I want you to notice that they were following Paul and the others, Silvanus and Timotheus, and maybe other people that were there as well, probably. But I see what I see there is that God uses people to lead and influence people people right by the way has he ever sent angels down to influence people yes yes he has he's he has a number of times mostly in the old testament that we know of but some in the new testament i mean the angels were standing there in acts chapter 1 8 uh looking up with the disciples and saying hey you're going to see him come just like he just like he left, you're going to see him come, right? So angels were sent. I'm not saying God can't send angels. I'm saying, what I'm saying is that's not his primary method of doing it. God's plan, his purpose for your life and for my life is this. Save them and then use them to influence other people with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. That's exactly what's going on in 1 Thessalonians. That's exactly what he commanded and told Paul to do when he saved him on the road to Emmaus. And that's exactly what we need to understand and what we need to do with our life. Notice verse number 9. It says, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living God. What's he saying? He's saying these people, whoever they were, he doesn't tell us who they were, but he says these people, as we look at their life, we see they've turned to God. We see that they've turned to God and they're telling us it was your testimony. They were looking at you. And you were looking at us. That tells me that God uses people to affect change in people so that they can in turn affect change in other people who can then turn and affect change in other people. And that brings me to this question for us. Who are you following, and are they leading you? Notice what it said about Paul He's, and, and the Thessalonians. He says, you became followers of, of us and of the Lord. And in another place, uh, 1 Corinthians, I believe it is, Paul said this, follow me as I follow Christ. The point is this. You should be following somebody who's following Christ. Are the people you're following, by the way, you are following somebody. You might be following them on Facebook. Maybe you're following them on YouTube. Maybe you're following them on some, some other social media channel, whatever. But the point is, you're following somebody. And you're going to emulate them to some degree or another. Are they worthy of being followed? Are they following Christ, and are they showing you an example of following Christ? Because, by the way, no matter what else others might be doing that you're following, if they're not leading you for Christ, they're leading you astray. 
or they're at least, at a minimum, leading you in something that doesn't make any difference at all. Paul said, you followed us, and, and then you influenced these others, and they followed you, and guess what? We're all following God. That's what he was praising them for. And so the question for us then becomes, who are you following and who's following you? And are you showing them how to follow Christ? Who is following you and can your faithfulness and following be seen in their lives? Because that's what Paul says of these, whoever these were. He's like, I see your faithfulness in them. And I see in them what we taught you. And we were following the Lord. You remember that old cliche that used to go around? I don't hear it much anymore. But it it started, you may be the only Bible that somebody reads today. There is truth in that. We're all following somebody and being followed by somebody. But we all ought to be following somebody who's following Christ, and we all ought to be affecting a followership that is then leading those people on for the Lord Jesus Christ. If your life isn't pointing people to Christ, you're probably wasting their time following you. Does your life teach people the Bible and the ways of the Lord Jesus Christ. Before I leave this point, I want to make one other thought here, one other observation, and that is this. They weren't just following Paul. Paul writes this letter, and he says, Paul, Silvanius, and Timotheus, under the church. By the way, the church is more than one person. There's a multitude of people there. How many? We don't know. But there were more than one. That's the point. Can I encourage you? The more people that Heartland Baptist Church has, leading people in the example and in the ways of Christ, the more people we can reach with the gospel and affect change in their lives. I hope, to, I hope that you see yourself as a part of an entity, of a, body, of, a, of, a, of a body of Christ that is affecting change in people's lives for Christ. Because if you're not, what are you leading them for? And man, that's a way we can make an incredible difference in a, in a place called heaven and in the kingdom of God. That's what it's all about. There was at least three men who began the influence at Thessalonica, but there was a whole church full of people that then their testimony was known, Paul says, everywhere, everywhere we went in every place, your faith to God word is spread abroad. He says, everywhere we go, people are talking about you guys. The more people that we get to to commit together and say, we're going to make a difference for Christ, we're going to be, we're going to lead by example, the more change we can affect. And you can see that in our community. I have people stop me regularly and say, hey, looks like you got a lot of people coming to church over there. And I say, you know, we're just short one person. If I could have one more person come. And they look at me with those big eyes, and I say, yeah, I've got a seat saved just for you. Well, I go somewhere. I, 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 I understand that. I just want you to understand. First of all, I take from that conversation, they're looking, they're noticing that if there's, for no other reason, your car is in the parking lot on somebody, people notice something about Heartland Baptist Church. You say, well, it's not important that I go to church this morning. It might be more important than you think. Maybe the message wasn't for you at all. Maybe you didn't hear anything new from the message from the preacher this morning. Maybe. 
But even your car in the parking lot says something to everybody that goes by it. By the way, including my mom, who drives by this parking lot every morning, every Sunday morning to drive into that parking lot. You realize you could be affecting something in my mom's heart as she drives by? I'm just saying, every little thing makes a difference. And it's observation, isn't it? People can't see in your heart, but they can see your car in the parking lot. They can see what's going on, right? They can look at the observable facts. I'm just saying that's how it worked in Thessalonica, and that's how it will work today, okay? Let me give you the third point, and I'll be done. Back in our text in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, I want to take notice of verses 7 and 8. It says, so that ye were in samples... Notice, to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. First of all, not everybody's going to believe. That's just the way it is. But he said, there isn't a person in Macedonia or Achaia, believer-wise, that hasn't heard about you. That's a blessing, right? Verse 8, for from you, notice, sounded out the word of the Lord not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. He goes, every time we open our mouth, he goes, yeah, we heard that from, Achaia, from uh, the Thessalonians. We heard that from the Thessalonian church. We know that because of what the Thessalonians said. He said, you were examples and samples to all that believe, but also in every place your faith to God is spread abroad. The people in the Thessalonian church went everywhere teaching, preaching, and speaking the living Word of God. They were a part of God's plan. And it was effective, and God used them. Are you a part of what God wants to do and, and will do and is, is doing in Heartland Baptist Church? Again, what is the commission? What's the last thing that Jesus said? Matthew 20, 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things. That's a lot of things, by the way. Uh, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. We don't have to go alone. Like I said in Sunday school, he's with us. He promised he would be. In just over two weeks, we'll have our annual missions conference as a church. Five different missionaries from five different places, from God's five different callings, will, will descend on Perryville to share their burden about what God wants to do with them in the field that he's called them to. They'll be sharing their testimonies about how God saved them and how that God has been using them in their life and then how God called them to go somewhere else to do that. By the way, if those missionaries were not faithful at their home church, they probably won't be faithful where they're going. I, every missionary that, that asked me to come to Heartland Baptist Church, he includes with his testimony and his documents a letter from his pastor that said he was busy at his home church. And we support him, and we, we think you should too. What am I saying? I'm saying if you're not doing it here, God's not going to call you to go somewhere else. Why would he? If you're not faithful where you are, he's probably not going to call you to do something somewhere else, Right? There'll be missionaries here telling people about, uh, telling us about their, the need of people to get saved in South Africa and in all of these places. These missionaries are willing to go to these countries, go to these places. They've left their homes. Even the brother that's, the, uh, brother Jackson that's coming to go to Cape Girardeau, he's from North Carolina. He's leaving his family. He's leaving his friends. He's left his job to go somewhere else to preach the gospel, gospel to a people he hasn't even met yet. God's affected something in his heart so that he can go and affect something in somebody else's heart. God's plan is to use people to lead other people to follow him and to be teachers and examples of God's Word to a people that they might not ever meet. Just like you all. You're going to leave here tomorrow. You're going to go to work. 
uh, go to school, go do something somewhere else. I'm never going to meet those people. But if I, through the gospel and through the preaching of this word, affect a change in you, you can affect and be an example of change to them. And then they can be an example of change to somebody else who can be an example of change to somebody else. And we can get a whole string of people following Jesus Christ that we have never even met and won't meet until we get to heaven. Wouldn't that be incredible? question is, will we as a church be a part of reaching people with the gospel message in Cape Girardeau and in Alaska and in South Africa and in in all these other places? Will we be a part of that? That's going to be the question at our missions conference. As Paul wrote this letter to the Thessalonians, he praised them because everywhere he went, he heard stories about their faith and the influence that they had on those people through Christ. That's what God's plan for your life is. That's where God has a plan for you. You're a middleman somewhere. You're being influenced so that you can be an influencer. So that they can be an influencer. Right? It's not about one purpose. Person, Paul, Sophanius, and Timotheus under the church of the Thessalonians. He said, It wasn't just me, it was us. And he wrote, by the way, he used the words us all through that passage. We and us, and we helped you, and we encouraged you, and you followed us so that you could follow, they could follow you. Verse 8 For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith to God's word is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. I want to give you three questions, and I'll be done. We're going to close with these three questions. The first question is this Have you turned from something to Christ? Whatever your sin is, whatever your besetting sin is, doesn't matter to me. Have you turned from that to Christ? By the way, if you do, it will have affected change in your life. There will be something noticeable by someone, and they will look at you and say, you're different, you're not who you used to be, you're not following what you used to follow. We'll, we'll be able to see it, just like they could see it in the Thessalonians' life. Second question is this. Are you following the testimony and the teaching of those who are, uh, who, who are living for God around you and that God has called them into your life to affect change in you and, and have leadership for you so that you could then affect change in somebody else's life. Which brings me to my last question this morning, and is that, that is this. Are others able to see Christ in your life and follow Christ Listen to this. Are they able and willing, are they able to follow Christ by following your testimony? Because that's exactly what Paul did to the Thessalonians. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy did to the Thessalonians. And then the Thessalonians did to everybody in Achaia uh, and, and uh, the places around there. Macedonia and Achaia. That's God's plan for us. That's what God wants to do in our life. Are you willing to be a part of that? The first thing that you have to do always is turn from these other things to Christ. Let's stand together this morning. God may be calling you to a mission field on the other side of the planet. Or he might be calling you to somebody that you work with, somebody that you go to school with, somebody that you uh, live next door to. I don't know what God might be calling you to. Maybe he's calling you to be a Sunday school teacher or a preacher or uh, a wife of one of those or uh, something like that. I don't know, but God wants you to be an influencer for the Lord Jesus Christ. I do know that. Father, I want to thank you for the day. Thank you for your love and mercy and grace. Thank you for allowing us to affect change and be an influencer in the world around us. 
Father, the world around us sure needs some influence. I pray that you'd help us and give us strength. You, you promised us in Matthew 28, 19, and 20 that you would go with us and never leave us nor forsake us, that you would help us and give us strength and boldness to be witnesses in this last day. I pray for that this morning, and I pray for these, that their life for Christ and their faith in Christ might be demonstrable, might be visible, might be uh, evidentiary in their life of those whom they will come in contact with this week for your glory and honor. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.